purpose of why we're teaching this is to develop a confidence on the inside of you that you can be confident in your commitment. And I'm going to show you why today. I think this will be a blessing to you. Let's look at our opening scripture today of uh, Ephesians chapter 4. And I'm going to read this to you out of the Passion Translation. The Passion Translation. And the Word tells us this. And I want you to, I'm going I'm to point a couple things out to you. So if you're taking notes, maybe if you can't jot these things down or go to your computer. And I did this uh, during the week. You can find the uh, Passion Translation online. Like go into your computer and type in the Passion Translation or is abbreviated TPT. And then type in your, whatever you want to look at and it'll come up. It's just there. It's cool. So it says this. The Holy Spirit of God has sealed you in Jesus Christ. Now look at this. You're sealed until you experience. Everybody say experience. Now sometimes we really overlook that term, but I'm telling you there's nothing like experiencing the fullness of salvation. So the Holy Spirit has all of us sealed until we experience the fullness of salvation. And we know that scriptures are always pointing to the fullness of salvation is when you're out of here and you're in the life to come. But I also believe that because Jesus says you're to pray that God's kingdom come and his will be done in this earth just as it is in heaven. I believe there's a place where we can experience the fullness of God in this life as well. How many of you believe you can be trained to reign in this life and when you get to your eternal reward, there really won't be that much difference? I believe that's possible. And so the Bible goes on to say, so never, because of what the Holy Ghost is doing for you, never grieve the Holy Spirit of God or take for granted His holy influence on your life. That is a huge statement, people, that we are to never take for granted what the Holy Ghost is doing with every one of us day by day. We should celebrate the presence of the Holy Spirit all the time. And I think sometimes we just get, we just forget. We're like leaking vessels, man. We leak all the time and we need to be refilled with our awareness of the Holy Spirit. Because he has holy influence over you. So he goes, aside, he goes on to say this. Now this is where we're dealing with now blood covenant reality. And so the Holy Spirit is an influence on my life to really bring forth the divine character of Christ. And so to have the divine character of Christ, there are going to be some things that you cannot or you should not participate with. So the influence of God now is on my life, and now I'm to do something. He says, lay aside bitter words, temper tantrums, revenge, put aside profanity, and all insults. Get rid of them. But instead... Be kind and affectionate to who? One another. Why? Because this is, our, this is the challenge that we all face. The challenge that we face is really not with Jesus. It's with people. Oh, if I could just live life without people. People are the problem, and you know that, but you know it sometimes you're the problem too. We're all the problem. We all step on each other's toes. We, we say and do things. And the word tells us how to get along. The word tells us right here, if you're going to be like Jesus, you've got to do something. We've got to prepare ourselves to say, you know what? I have got to live my life under the holy influence of the Holy Ghost so that I never again live life with bitter words. Or do I have temper tantrums? or revenge, or profanity, or insults, but I got to be kind, so I'm going to be like Jesus. I got to be affectionate. I got to be like God, because God has graciously forgiven you, correct? All right. So in other words, to be kind and affection is, the res- is to also be forgiving. So when you're insulted, you're influenced, is, 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 in other words, you've been influenced negatively, if you'll just be kind and affectionate, you're being drawn towards forgiveness. Then graciously forgive one another in the depths of Christ's love. Now think about the term, in the depths of Christ's love. How much did Jesus love us? He left the portals and the glories of heaven. He came to the earth, became one of us. He lived perfect, and then he died for us. That's the depth of his love. 
He took on the curse so that we could be redeemed. That's the depth of his love. And the scripture right here says that you and I are to forgive one another in the depths of that type of love. And to make sure that we understand exactly what he means, that in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, so then be imitators of him. Be an imitator of God in everything you do. And then, 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 you see, when we learn the depth of his love, then you and I will represent our Father in this earth. And continue to walk surrendered to this extravagant love of Christ. For he surrendered his life as a sacrifice for us. His great love, he calls it great love. But when you sacrifice your life to display love, that's called great love. And it's pleasing to God. I don't know about you, but I want to be a God pleaser. You know what? And I haven't, I'll be honest with you, as, a, as your pastor, I haven't dealt a lot with this area of, Learning to live the suffering life of Christ by simply knowing that in this life, I'm going to face struggles. I'm going to have bad things happen because of relationships and because of people and things happen. But if I can allow the Holy Ghost to have his divine, holy influence on me, I can get to this particular place where I can be pleasing to the Father. Wow. Every one of us have that ability to be pleasing to the Father. You know how that's possible? And this is where I want to go. This is what gives you confidence in your commitments. Is because the one who did all that, who left glory, who suffered shame, who was rejected, persecuted, went to trial, died, but was resurrected, is the one who lives in you. So in other words, he qualifies us to be like him. You see, he lives in you and he lives on you. And I know sometimes you don't want to do these things, but when you don't want to do it and you do do it, that's called the sacrifice of love. It's called suffering, the suffering aroma of a loving Savior. And listen to what it says next. This aroma of adoration is a sweet healing fragrance. So in other words, the healing between you and whatever you're dealing with begins when you're kind and affectionate and you're gentle and you're like Jesus. You say, when does the relationship begin to heal? The moment you act like Jesus. The moment you allow the divine influence of God on your life is the moment that this healing aroma begins to work in your situation. Amen? Amen. Now, Cammie, we're going to jump all the way to now Psalm 78. All the way to the end, Psalm 78, I want to show you this. Because I want you to understand who lives on the inside of you, all right? And do you have the ability to be covenant people? Can you live a covenant lifestyle with people because you're in covenant with a loving God? Here's what the scripture says in Psalm 78. He says, cowards to God's covenant, people are bullheaded and bad fickle and faithless, never true to God. So you see the significance of a covenant-minded person. If you're not covenant-minded, the word says you're bullheaded, you're bad, you're fickle, you're faithless, and you're never true to God. And the Bible says that these types of people never forget uh, what he's, uh, they never forget what he has done and they sin even more. So they always are practicing more and more sin. They whined like small children because they didn't believe God and they had no intention of trusting his help. They wanted to do everything uh, their own way. So they, they wanted nothing to do with this covenant. But I want you to notice this. But God, people didn't want to have anything to do with him. But God. But God, everybody say, but God, God. helped them anyway. God, compassionate, forgave and didn't destroy. Over and over, he reigned in his anger and restrained his considerable wrath. He took his flock safely through the wilderness, took care of them, and they had nothing to fear. Now, that's who lives in you. He's pushed, he was pushed and provoked, and yet he never destroyed. He just loved. That's who lives in you. That's why it's, it's very difficult for us to think that we cannot forgive. Because forgiveness is alive and well on the inside of you. 
you're fully capable of living in covenant with God and in covenant with one another if you choose to believe and choose to exercise your faith. You see, what's so significant about church is that in church, we're going to have difficulties and we're going to have struggles and there, there's, it's just family living. But you know what's beautiful? I was thinking of it this morning. If you've ever had children, you know that there are challenges in the life of parents and children. But you know what? You'll never get rid of your children. You'll fight for them. You might be angry with them for a short moment. There may be a separation for just a small season. But you know what? I'm not giving up on my babies. I'm not giving up. And then there's, there's your spouse. It's like, I'm not giving up on them. I'm faithful. But there's something about them children. And I'm telling you, if church is like a bunch of, a bunch of family members with a bunch of kids and a bunch of moms and dads, and we just got to realize, man, sometimes there, there are difficulties, but if we'll just stay stuck to faithfulness, God does something so miraculous. Because listen, the whole key that we're talking about here is that the church is the most powerful institution in the whole world. And Satan does everything in his power to wreck your life in the body of Christ. All right, so let's look at a couple things. I want to make this statement to you as we begin. Scripture teaches us that those who walk straight will settle the land because integrity lasts. In other words, being upright and being whole lasts forever because God is a God of integrity. So if we're a people of integrity, in other words, we keep our word, we keep our promises. The Bible says those who walk straight, there's a promise. If you walk straight in covenant like Jesus, there's an anointing on a people like that to settle the land. So what do you mean by that? That means we take authority over principalities and powers. We know how to fight our warfare by suiting up in Jesus Christ. You know what the armor of God is? It really represents Christ and his character. I shod my feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace so that I can stand firm on his word. I gird my lords about with truth it's because this truth makes me stable. I put on the breastplate of righteousness because I cover my heart with his holiness so that I can reflect his glory. I put on the helmet of salvation to ward off all the fiery darts that the wicked one sends because they do come. I take faith and I allow it to lead me into life and I take the word of God and with those two offensive weapons and me covered in Christ Jesus, he's my shield and my buckler and I just make advancements and I never have to worry about what's on the rear because he's my protection. You see, if, as long as I'm chasing after Jesus, you never have to worry about anybody shooting you in the back. And so when you put on Jesus, you can settle the land. It's a great promise that God's given to the body of Christ. Do you know that on your life, if you'll be a covenant man or woman, you have the authority of God to settle your neighborhood, to settle your family, to settle anything in your life. You have that type of authority. So everybody say, I will walk right, I will walk straight, and I will settle this land. Now in Psalm chapter 119, the Bible says this, God prescribed the right way to live. He did it. He teaches us how to live. So be steady. Keep to the course that he sets, and then look at this, and then you'll never have any regrets. So if you do it his way, there's no regrets. There's no regrets when you're faithful to God. You always are going to be kind and affectionate. You're always going to be loving and patient. You're always going to be a reflection of Jesus. And I promise you, when we're like that, there will never be a regret. And you know, sometimes people do stuff. Some of you are bosses and you have employees and people just do some foul things. And you have every right to be angry and frustrated. And some of you are employees and you feel like you're not getting your fair shake. And so you're tempted to do things that are wrong and you take from people. You, listen, the Bible says, leave all those things beside. Make Jesus the Lord of your life. Be fair and, and trustworthy. Be kind and gentle. And you'll never have a regret. Never. Never. So what is this message about? The message of covenant is really about providing you with confidence. Confidence that you can really lean into the strength and the integrity of God's promise. That you can know that he's in covenant with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never fail you. He's always faithful to you. And so when he's like that to you, then you're re to reflect him to the society that we live in. And if we do that, then we'll settle the land. I said we'll settle the land. Now, in Psalms 105, the Bible teaches us this. It's the covenant-minded that are in charge of all of God's business. Look at this. This is so significant. 
It's the covenant-minded men and women who are in charge of the business of God. And look at this. They work marvels in spiritual wastelands. In other words, the Bible says covenant-minded people do supernatural things in impossible situations because they, they trust him. They know who he is, and so they know that if he's the way maker and I trust him and lean into him and do it his way, then I'm going to do something marvelous in a barren wilderness. Amen. Something good will come out of this. But I want you to take the next portion of this promise where it says that he helps them, the covenant-minded, seize the wealth of the nations. Why? So they could do everything that he told them and they can follow his instructions to the very letter. In other words, there's provision that comes with the covenant-minded people. Why? Because covenant-minded people are in covenant with God. And they're looking to do what he wants them to do. And so he makes sure that you have ample supply to be a blessing. How many of you believe that God is a blessing? How many believe that Jesus has come and he has blessed us, but he still remains the blessing? He is the blessing. Well, then God wants to put stuff in your hands and in your life so that you can reflect him to your generation. Where does that come and how does it come? It comes to the covenant minded. Those who are not afraid of walking in covenant with God and with man. It takes courage, though. I said it takes courage. It takes courage to be covenant. Listen, there are different levels of relationships. There's friendships. There are partnerships. There are marriage relationships. There are children. There's different levels. But in everything, you're never required to do anything less than in every level of a relationship to be kind and affectionate. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how deep the relationship is. That if you, Let's just say it's a friend. You're supposed to be kind and affectionate to a friend. And the moment that you come into contact with your spouse, <laughs> you're to be kind and affectionate to your spouse. You're supposed to be kind and affectionate to your children. It doesn't matter what level the relationship is. If we're going to be like Jesus, you just got to be like Jesus. And it never fails you. So God, in his solemn honor, always does what's right. Now, that term solemn honor just simply means this. In God's formal and dignified high respect, he does it right. God always does it right. You know why he does it right? Because he's righteous. Listen, you know why Jesus does it right? Because he's righteous. But who are you now? You have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So according to the scriptures, you're righteous. And because you're righteous and he's righteous, then we should in solemn honor do all things right. Hallelujah. Remember, it's the righteous who are going to settle the land. Wow. The blessing of the Lord is here. The blessing of the Lord is here. I can feel him working on the inside. And that's what's happening today in this message. Remember last week we started off the service with an old song. I don't know. Do you have that little song that we had last week on uh, how easy is that? Hit it. Y'all remember this? Mm, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. That there's just too little love that the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, that's just for some. But for everyone. You heard the last part? Not just for some, but for everyone. You see, what the world is lacking and why the church world is actually sometimes laughed at and mocked is because within its own doors, we talk about love, but then it's so difficult to live it out. But boy, if we could only get this mindset called covenant and live it out where we're really like we're patient with each other. We are. We come into relationships understanding we're not going to fulfill each other's needs completely. We do everything in our power to be a friend, but we all let each other down. So if we don't take the bait of Satan and will not allow ourselves to be offended then we just grow. As people, we grow. Relationships get deeper. Relationships get better. Then all of a sudden, I walk out of my troubles. I walk out of my dark places because I got a friend with me. 
It's covenant. So wonderful, isn't it? So Psalm chapter 3 says this. How many of you agree with this? I believe this, that God shields me on all sides. That means he does all things right. So what he does out of love, he shields you on all sides. And because he shields me on all sides, he grounds my feet and he lifts my head, which means now covenant gives me confidence. You see, his love gives me confidence. You see, Rachel gives me confidence. I give Rachel confidence. I've already heard my children tell me that there's no question of that we love them. They said, there's no question that you love me. It's evident. We know that. So what does that do? That adds confidence. How many of you know children prosper when they're underneath the umbrella of covenant confidence? That I'm loved and they will never leave nor forsake me. Well, that's what the church life is supposed to be like. That's what your business life is supposed to be like. That's what every arena of your life is supposed to be like. Covenant mindedness. And it's on different levels, but it all remains the same. That we're going to ground people to the ground. We're going to lift their head because we're there as a friend. And even in bad times, we're going to pray, we're going to seek God, we're going to acquire His presence, and we're not just going to let people walk. Because I don't know about you, but I've found now that my life is much better with my friends than without them. My life is much more richer with you in my life than it would be if you're not in my life. I need you. And you know what? You need me. That's just what life is. We need each other. And what, every, you know, and what the devil tries to do is to say, you know what, they really don't love you. They take you for granted. And maybe sometimes we do. But how many of you know we can do a better job? And hopefully this message will bring us to another level where we start really respecting and honoring each other on a higher level. Amen. Glory to God. Now let's look at Psalms chapter 41. The Bible says this. Now God knows me inside and out. That means he, God knows my humanity. He knows my blind sides. But yet, <laughs> he knows my frailty. He knows my weakness. He knows my struggles. But he holds me together because he's covenant. And he never fails to stand me tall in his presence so that I can look him right in the eye and do what he tells me to do. In other words, he strengthens me. He enables me to be kind and affectionate, to be patient and loving. He gives me the strength to do that. He said, Pastor, what's this message all about? This is, look, 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 this is what it's about. When you get struck in the heart, you run right to Jesus. And he's the source of your strength. And he will enable you to do anything that you need to do to overcome the pain. And the moment that you bring that to him, that healing aroma begins to be released. And listen, the healing aroma begins to work. And before you know it, that healing activity starts in your relationship and it's going to be mended. Come on, Jesus! Ha ha! Now, let's make this statement. This is so true. And this is why covenant is so important. But men, listen, men and women, if we are a people without a covenant foundation, without understanding the significance of covenant, because God keeps his word. He's given you his promise, and he's a man, a God of integrity. If we don't have covenant mindedness within ourselves, then man becomes a liar. Man becomes a backstabber. Man can become cheaters, and man can become truce breakers. And it's all based upon not understanding the significance of being covenant minded. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you like being lied to? Do you like being a backstabber or being backstabbed? Do you like cheaters? How about truth breakers? The only way that we can keep ourselves from these actions is to understand the significance of covenant. I can't control what the other person does, but I can control my attitude to be covenant before God and to them. I have to be. You have to be. I'm telling you, the future to the strength of our life is in covenant. So here's what blood covenant does. Blood covenant demands, it demands strength and integrity. It demands absolute, unwavering loyalty. Why? Because that's who he is. 
It demands loyalty. Why? Because that's who lives in you. He's faithful to you. So Proverbs chapter 21 tells us this. A God-loyal person will see right through the wicked. And that God-loyal person will undo the evil that's planned. How? How do you do it? By love? By respect? By honor? You see, God-loyal people have discernment. And it's not evil. It's good discernment. That this is a ploy of the devil. And he's trying to kill, steal, and to destroy. And I will not allow it to happen. Everybody still with me? Yeah. All right, now we're almost done. Everybody still cool? Yeah. All right. Let's look at a couple more things and then we'll say uh, adios in just a second. So let me ask you this question. What would happen to the divorce rate if we all viewed God's response to the fall of man as being the precedent that was set to a failing relationship. What would happen? Now I'm not just talking about divorce. From the position of husband and wife. Though that is bad. But I am talking about that. But I'm talking about in every area of life. How many of you know there's so many divorces in life. Friends. Colleagues. Just stuff happens. You know we, we have people that are like in our life. That have moved away. That's not a divorce. Because those friendships still contain. I mean, we still got people that are calling us from all over the nation, still listening to the podcast, still a part of our ministry, still sending in finances from all over the nation that have left out. That's different. But when there's, an, when there's odds, bang. What would happen if we started looking at our relationships like God looked at man when man broke relationship with God, with, with him? So the heart of the message is that Jesus redeemed us because he's committed to our well-being. In other words, when we're like Jesus and we're committed to the well-being of the relationship, that's the heart of God. Now, how many of you believe that commitment, everybody say commitment. Commitment is covenant. Commitment restores relationship. Commitment restores relationship. Because the nature of sin is to separate, but the nature of God is to restore. The nature of sin is to break things apart, but the nature of God is to put it back together. And we're going to conclude with these two scriptures right here. Matthew chapter 5 says this. Jesus puts and pulls it all together. Now, look, when you go back and you do some reading in the scriptures, you're going to find what I've done in these texts is I've read the text, and for me, I've pulled together the context of what the Word is speaking to me. So here's what the Word says. Jesus puts and pulls it all together. So take the Word seriously by showing the way for others, and you'll find honor in the kingdom. So first of all, to find honor in the kingdom, there has to be a showing of what is right, what's integrity. This is how you are to conduct yourselves. Make things right with your friend by making the first move and then work things out with God. You remember the story where the word says that if you come to the altar and you bring your gift and you take note of, I have a friend who has ought against me. He says, leave the gift there and go make friends with your friend and then come back and provide your offering. What we're saying here is that what God is saying, Jesus puts and pulls it all together. Jesus tells us this, take this word seriously. Show the way to others, and if you do, you'll find honor in the kingdom. And this is how I want you to conduct yourself. I want you to make things right with your friends by making the first move. Ooh. The responsibility is on covenant-minded people. I don't want to make the first move. I know because it makes you vulnerable to pain again. But if you make the first move, then the Bible says you can work things out with God. I appreciate the amen. <laughs> Covenant gets deep, huh? Covenant exposes blood and guts. But that's where covenant is made. 
You got to walk through the blood. You got to walk through the guts. You got to walk through the pain. But when you do, you come out with health and life and healing is now being able to be released. But covenant minded people reach out first. Let's look at this. Matthew chapter five again. So Jesus, after this, says, don't hit back. Ooh, doggy. Ooh, doggy. Yeah, they gave you that finger that, that you don't like looking at, but you ain't supposed to give them the finger back. Yeah, they gave you a smart mouth, and you got to be kind and patient. Yeah, you know what they did. They're so foul and nasty. They cut you off in traffic. I saw the other day... Uh, I was, I was driving to New Orleans, and they got two lanes of traffic, and it was in, actually in New Orleans, and this elderly lady, she was on her phone playing around, and for some reason, she just decided she was gonna pass everybody up, so she passed up two cars, and all of a sudden, she just like squeezed in, like just squeezed in in front of the car in front of me. So that car in front of me decided, uh-uh, Jack, you didn't do that to me, got over on the side of the road, passed her up, and jammed their car right in front of her. I mean, he's like, really? Now, in my old days, <laughs> before I got married, no, before Rachel brought me into compliance, I know exactly what that person feeling like. So the Bible says don't hit back. But listen to what the word says. But use every occasion to practice the servant life. <laughs> So live generously. Love your enemies. Let them, your enemies, bring the best out of you. Let them bring Jesus out of you. Respond with the energy of prayer, not harsh words, not criticism, not condemnation. You pray for those who despise you. And then... You'll be working out of your true selves, your God-created selves. So here's the standard. Live the way God lives towards you. Oh, Jesus. This is getting pretty thick. That's thick. I got to reflect Jesus. You got to reflect Jesus. Uh, you ever felt like, ah, uh, ah, uh, really? Yeah, but remember who lives in you. The one who's telling you, you can. He empowers you to forgive. He empowers you to be a friend. He empowers you to be patient. He empowers you to be kind. It's his characteristics. It's his nature living on the inside of you. And when you submit to the kingdom and the king, it flows out of you. You ever been in a position that in the moment of hostility, you responded in quietness, you responded in kindness, and the moment you walked away from the situation, them fire darts start coming, shoo, 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 and you said, I should have said. Thank God you didn't. The work of the Holy Ghost and His divine influence was on your life to keep your mouth shut so that you could look like Jesus. And the aroma of your suffering begins the healing process. Glory to God. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. This confidence that when you do it Jesus' way, when you do it right there, it's a seed plant for healing and it starts right then. So we will conclude with this thought. Blood covenant erases, excuse me, blood covenant raises the level of commitment but blood covenant also erases divorce from consideration. Let's say that again, because I know this is popular. Blood covenant raises the level of commitment, and it also erases divorce from all consideration. Isn't that good? Amen. Now let's do this. Let's all stand.